Okay, so week three, again, just to reiterate, all of the lectures are being recorded and posted. So you can actually see weeks one and two already if you go to our department website and look under um, events. I think it's events and lectures, not events and other opportunities. And there's a link there for this uh, seminar along with the recordings. I think Dinesh has posted them on YouTube. Today, what I'd like to do is lay the foundation first of hypothesis testing so we can make sure that we all understand what it is we're actually doing when we do a t-test or a chi-square test. And then we're going to get into tests for comparing means. I will do a couple of brief demonstrations using a tool that I really like called RStudio that's free and uh, available for download for anyone. And then if time permitting, we'll get to tests of uh, binary outcome data, so like response rates between groups or counts or frequencies uh, between groups. T if we get to that, the next time we'll cover regression strategies, uh, linear regression, logistic regression, survival analysis. We'll focus mainly on when do you apply each and how do I interpret things like the Kaplan-Meier curves that you get when you do a survival, survival analysis, or how do I interpret a hazard ratio? How do I interpret the regression parameters in uh, linear regression? How do I interpret odds ratios? Those kinds of things. So some of the more common tests. Uh, if you're here and you didn't hear something that you would like covered, send it to me this weekend, because I have to, I'm gonna do quite a bit of work revamping uh, week four over the coming week. So if there's a certain topic that you're interested in and I think that I can feasibly manage to fit it in next week, I'm still open for suggestions. Okay, so to begin with, we're going to be doing hypothesis testing and estimation to the remainder of the course. So it's important that we understand what that uh, process looks like. In essence, just like in other areas of statistics, we're using a sample of observed data from a population or generated by an experiment to try to get at some unobserved true state to make inferences about the population. When I say the population, it could actually be some phenomenon of interest. So if you're, at, if you're looking more at, at a, a biological level, you might be interested in true cause and effect relationships. But if you're doing a clinical trial, um, you're interested in, well, how is this drug going to work in the population of patients it's, that I'm designing it for? And so statistics is the science that provides us with the ability to formally draw the connections between a sample and the population or phenomenon. And then get some quantification of how good we think those results are. And so when I say good, I mean how uncertain are we that this is a valid result, a quote-unquote true result as opposed to maybe just a function of sampling error or maybe an incorrect decision. So let's lay the groundwork with a quick example in traumatic brain injury and cognitive status. One of the big issues in traumatic brain injury sufferers is that even survivors with similar injuries, they could have huge variation in their cognitive outcomes. And so some researchers, this comes from a modified from a publication, I'm just using their research question. Um, researchers may want to know why two individuals who have the exact same TBI type injury, why do they have very different cognitive outcomes? Why are some doing better than others? Because that might allow them to design interventions to target a specific set of, of TBI sufferers. And so this individual um, and colleagues decided to look at higher lifetime intellectual enrichment, which basically means people who use their brains, and they're using a surrogate for that as, in terms of their level of education, does that maybe pr offer some protection after TBI? So they did a pilot study to estimate cognitive status. They have a score for individuals with varying levels of education prior to their traumatic brain injury and they also compared them to healthy controls. So let's think about this in terms of a study that maybe we could do potentially. This distribution, this function, I'm sure many of you have seen before, it's a normal distribution. This is 
since we're doing a test here of an average cognitive status, more than likely we're going to do something like a t-test or maybe even ANOVA depending on how many groups we have. But the idea here is the assumption of that test to make it work mathematically for the p-value to be meaningful and that test statistic to be meaningful, you have to make assumptions and then verify those assumptions are met. So we're assuming that cognitive status score in the population, let's just assume that this is just the population at large, the cognitive status score follows an approximately normal distribution. The average individual um, in the population has a cognitive status score of zero. So something, a value of zero would indicate normal cognitive function. People who have enhanced cognitive function according to this score would be on the right hand side. Notice the further we get away from the average, the height of the curve is dropping. What does that mean? That means fewer and fewer people, relatively speaking, exist out here in the tails. And for many things that just occur naturally, this makes sense, right? We have some kind of average behavior, and then we have outliers, unusual. They're real, right? We have people who have really high cognitive status scores. They exist, but they're few and far between. And then on the opposite end of that, in a very symmetric fashion, we have individuals who have impaired cognitive status. And again, the further away from the population average you get, the fewer and fewer individuals you'll find with those scores. So it's very important that we understand how to read a function like this. The x-axis is the measure of interest, and then the height of the function rep represents the relative number or proportion of individuals in that population who have scores in that region. So you can see its height is at zero, which by definition is the average. So let's suppose that, that you do a small experiment. You collect, you randomly sample from the population 10 individuals and you record through some instrument their cognitive status score. So what I've done is I've shown you at the top here the population that you drew from. Let's assume for a minute that this is what the population looks like. We never really know the truth. If we did, we wouldn't be doing statistics. We would just be describing the truth. But suppose that we know that this is the truth and the little dots here show you the location of the scores for the 10 people that you randomly sampled in your representative sample, if you will. And then what I've dropped down on this matching x-axis, but just below it, I still have the x-axis being cognitive status score, but now I've described your sample using a histogram. Is this clear to everyone? Population I'm sampling from? Your sample. So that's a histogram. So notice that you had mo you know, two individuals or three individuals kind of clustered here just above zero. You have a couple of individuals that are above 1.5 and a couple of individuals that are below negative 1.5. But probably on the average, the average of your 10 subjects gives you a sample cognitive status mean very close to zero. It's 0.137. So you're, if, if, if we know the truth and we have this sample, we can see that we got really lucky because we got a sample that reflected the truth. It was very representative. Now, what if I work at a different institution totally separate from you. My research interest, though, is in the same area, and I decide, independently of you, to run the exact same experiment. And this happens, right? Independently of you, I also decide to randomly sample from the same population. I'm also going to randomly sample 10 patients or 10 subjects, just like you did. And I'm going to measure the exact same thing you measured. So my point is, we have done the exact same thing. The only difference is that you had 10 patients from the population and I ended up with 10 different patients. My 10 patients are shown here. Their cognitive status scores. And this is my histogram. So the same methods, the exact same process, produced two different samples. And my 
sample average, my cognitive status average, is a little bit higher than yours. In fact, it's a little further away from the truth than yours was. Your sample was quote unquote better than mine, even though we did it the same way. My sample resulted in an average of 0.346. And my question to you is why, what is the thing, the name of the thing that caused our two samples from two identical experiments to give slightly different sample averages. What is the thing that, that causes that difference? Sampling variability, right, it's right there on the screen. So we have this thing called sampling variability. Now all it means is that you will get slightly different results in different samples drawn from the same population. You won't get the exact same information or the exact same estimate unless you sample the entire population, unless you can see the truth. And in that case, if you're able to record cognitive status for every individual in that population, and I am too, unless we have a data entry error, we should get the exact same results. But when we're working with samples, we're going to get variability in our uh, results from experiment to experiment as a function of sampling variability. So we each individually only sampled 10 subjects. The chances that my sample will consist of the exact same subjects as yours or another set of 10 subjects that have the exact same information contained in their cognitive status score is very small. Because I only did 10, you only did 10. This population is probably millions of people. So sampling variability, it turns out, is a function of the size of the sample taken relative to the size of the population you're pulling it from. So if I have a really small population and I sample quite a bit of it, then a person who does the exact same experiment as me would get very, very similar results because we are actually capturing more of the picture. So there's less chance for us to have an impact from sampling variability. So if you increase the size of your sample, you're increasing the chances of the same information contained in both samples. So we're, our, there's similarity between our estimates and reduction in sampling variability. So if we think back to how this is portrayed in the literature, when someone reports the average um, response in a, in, a, in a sample, so the sample mean, they record, report next to it a measure of the quality of the estimate, either through a confidence interval or something called the standard error. Both of those things relay to you the sampling variability in that estimate. In other words, what that person, that author is telling you is if you were to go and replicate my experiment identically, you could be somewhere within this bound. You might get an estimate somewhere within this bound, plus or minus a standard error or within the confidence interval. So it's just relaying that this is what I got from my sample, but likely values could have been a certain degree lower or a certain degree higher simply as a function of sampling variability. So I'm just showing you as we increase samples, we increase kind of the overlap in information. The reason I'm spending a little bit of time on this is because this underlies, like I said, the standard error. It underlies things like confidence in terms of confidence intervals and p-values. So let's extend this beyond just me and you doing a, an experiment identically. What if 15 other people at 15 other institutions are doing the identical, the, the exact same experiment in the exact same way, taking 10 subjects randomly from this population, recording the exact same thing on them, and also taking a look at this average cognitive status score. So this one was yours, right? This is your sample here in the middle, drawn from the population. What I've done is I've marked your sample average, which is the estimate of interest here, in blue on that. And then I'm going to drop your average down. I'm going to create a new histogram on the bottom. I'm going to try to see how for, for many people doing the same experiment independently, what is, 
how, how different are their results? If we're reporting the sample mean, it's, it would be easy to, to see that in a histogram for maybe two, right? So here's mine and here's yours. Now what if, again, just to clarify what these things are, the population is at the top that we're sampling from, and individual experiments results are in the middle, and at the bottom I'm kind of compiling the results of many different experiments done addressing the same question. So now I've, you haven't seen it, but I kind of cycled through uh, three more experiments. And now what I've done is I've dropped their averages, their sample means, down here on the bottom. So at the bottom, what I'm showing you is sample means, sample cognitive status score means, for five different experiments that were conducted identically, each having ten subjects. They all get some different results. Notice some of them are getting averages below zero. Some of them are getting averages above zero. But they're all pretty close to zero. They're all pretty close to the truth. I've already told you what this is. I've told you what this is. That's one sample. But I haven't really given this thing a name. So what I've done here now is I just increased that from five experiments to a thousand experiments. So I, I used R and I simulated data so I could create this thing to mimic um, the results, the sample means from let's say a thousand or ten thousand different experiments. Anyone know what this thing's called? It is a histogram of sample means of a thousand samples. It's called the sampling distribution. Unfortunately, the way we teach statistics these days, we tend to, we underestimate our students. So we don't even tell them that this thing exists. We just tell you, if you have a mean and you can assume normality, then step one is this, step two is that, step three is that, step four is the p-value, it's over here if this, it's over here if that. So you're doing things, you're following a recipe and you're not a chef. But we should be making you chefs. In particular of t-tests, there's no reason why you couldn't understand what a p-value is. This thing called the sampling distribution, again, I've done this in a way that doesn't really mimic reality, right? Because we never do a thousand different experiments on this, or addressing the same question. But the idea here is that the person who came up with the t-test was able to mathematically derive this distribution at the bottom, the sampling distribution of the mean. We know exactly the functional form of it. it. It's a normal distribution. Does everyone see it looks normal? If I were to do this for a million different experiments on 10 subjects, then this thing would be really smooth, really, like it would look like what we have at the top, only it wouldn't have the same measure of variability. It wouldn't be quite as fat, if you will. But a couple of things to notice about this distribution, this sampling distribution of a thousand different experiments. The average of this distribution, so the average of the averages, is basically zero. It's negative .0025, which is essentially zero. The standard deviation, and I should mention, for a normal distribution, I neglected to mention this, we describe a normal with two characteristics, its average and a measure of its variability called the standard deviation. The standard deviation is just the distance between the mean and something called an inflection point. The inflection point is just the point where this kind of turns from a, uh, a tub, bathtub, sh or excuse me, a cap to a tub. Notice how it just switches there. So it's a, called an inflection point. But again, it's just a measure of how dispersed the data is, how variable it is. But it turns out this standard deviation, and all I'm describing is how much it varies, this standard deviation is 0.49, and that is directly related to the variability in the population we're sampling from. In fact, this thing has a name, and you see it all the time. In fact, you guys report it all the time. I wanted to get to it. I'll go back. 
you report all the time something called the standard error, right? If you're reporting an average, you're reporting the standard error along with it because what are you telling your audience? You're telling them something about the sampling variability of your estimate. If it has a really big sampling variability, then the standard error is going to be really big, right? Because this standard error, that's all this is. It's just that distance. It's just the standard deviation of these sample means. So again, the purpose of a sampling distribution, we never do 10,000 or a million or a thousand experiments identically. But we rely on the fact that if we did do this over and over and over again, we want to know how in the long term or in the long run, how good is this method I'm using. So the sampling distribution tells us the behavior of the statistic in repeated experiments. What are the most likely values that are to be generated by experiments done in this way? How much would the results from multiple experiments vary? And then the question that we're always looking at in terms of hypothesis testing, which is where the p-value comes in, is, well, I actually did the experiment, and I got a sample mean. How likely is it that my sample mean came from a population that looks like that? And that's a hypothesis test. So the p-value tells us the probability of getting what we actually observed if the distribution looks the way we've hypothesized it to look. And I'll go through that. So notice, let's say that this is me. I'm this, I did this experiment that resulted in a mean somewhere here kind of close to the center. Many, many other people could do identical experiments and get results very similar to mine because the, notice the number of those estimates, the sample averages, are very high. What if you did the experiment and you got an average out here in the tail? It's still possible, right? It's still possible if the true cognitive status score is zero. It's still possible to get an average out here. We just showed it's possible because we actually did an experiment that resulted in an average out here in the tail. And then look at this guy. This poor guy did this experiment and he followed all the rules and he still got bad evidence. He got dealt a bad hand, I think is what uh, the textbook that I recommended last week said. He got dealt a bad hand and he, just by random chance, ended up with a sample that told him that, that's leading him away from the truth, if you will. And that's, you know, it's what. But the problem is you follow the data, right? Follow the data. Follow the experiment. Because we can see the data. We can't see the truth. So again, we use this relationship between what we assume the population to look like and then some mathematics underneath to draw inferences about our particular experimental results. So if the population have, has a mean of zero, this is called the central limit theorem for those of you who have uh, heard of it, the central limit theorem about the sampling, the sample average. If you're drawing from a population whose mean is zero, then the sampling distribution for x bar, which is the sample average, will center at the truth. So that means on average experiments done from this population will result in values of zero, sample means of zero. If the population has a variability measure of 1.5, let's just, let's don't worry about what it means, it's just kind of a, a degree of vari variation in the, in the population, then we know that the sampling distribution, its variability is the population variability scaled by how big your sample is. And it happens to be that the, the metric to scale it by is the square root of the sample size. So everyone knows how ratios work. What happens to the variation in the sampling distribution of the mean if I go from a sample of size 5 to a sample of size 10? What happens to the standard deviation of those means? 
it decreases, right? And you can see it here, it doesn't project well. But this is for five here in red, and this is for 10 here in green. So what is that telling me? That's telling me if, if, if lots of people are doing experiments of size five, they're gonna get lots of different conclusions. There, there's, uh, there's chances even way out here in the tail that they're going to get really, like maybe the truth is, is zero, but they're going to get really negative or really positive results more frequently than individuals who do larger experiments. So you reduce your chances of getting that highly unusual estimate, the one that's way out there in the tail, if you have a, a, a larger sample size because you're what you're doing is you're reducing the variation of the sampling distribution. And again, that thing that we talk about is the standard error of the mean. It takes into account the population variation and the sample size. And it's fundamental to everything that you've ever learned or done, more than likely, um, from statistics. Classical statistics relies on this thing in order for the results to be generated. It gives us things like power of a test, type one error rates of a test, sample size estimates for an experiment. It gives us those things called test statistics, which we'll cover here in a moment. P-values come from the sampling distribution, standard errors, as I've just shown you, and confidence intervals. So we're gonna circle back to some of these for our first few examples in hypothesis testing, and I hope that that will maybe shed some light on what exactly a p-value is. So this, so the standard deviation, so if you, you can report the mean, but if you report the standard deviation, you're reporting the standard deviation, let me go back here you're reporting the standard deviation of this histogram when you report your standard deviation, um, which tells the reader the variability in your data. If you report the standard error of your estimate, it tells the reader the quality of your estimator or your estimate. So it's like reporting the mean and the confidence interval. So the confidence interval, the, the, the in English interpretation is Here's my guess at the true value of the population average. That's my sample mean. But I'm going to acknowledge that my experiment, which was done maybe on 50 subjects, my experiment could have resulted in an average as low as this or as high as this. And so when, when you acknowledge that uncertainty, you're just telling individuals, you know, it, my experiment says it's five, but when I calculate the standard error and then maybe give you a confidence interval, I have to acknowledge that it could be as low as, you know, negative two and as high as ten, which tells the reader that you don't have a lot of confidence or there's a lot of uncertainty in your result. And if you have a very narrow confidence interval, then you're reflecting the fact that your experiment doesn't have a lot of it doesn't, it's set up in a way that its results wouldn't be subject to as much sampling variability. So if you say, my best guess that the truth is 5, as low as 4.7, as high as 5.3, you have very little sampling variability in that conclusion, and readers will be able to see that. So what you're saying is experiments done the way that I just did them should result in most cases in a mean that's very close to what I got. 4.7 to 5.3 and I got 5. So that's the way you interpret the standard error or the confidence interval, if you will. Yes? You, no, you don't. You don't need to know it. I, I've given you a kind of a contrived example where I've given you the truth. Um, very So the standard error that I gave you here comes from something called the Z-test. And so if you, if you remember back in your undergraduate statistics class, whenever you took statistics, you have a Z-test and then a T-test. And they're doing the same thing, but the T-test 
estimates this thing because we don't know what it is, right? A Z test assumes this value is something. But the T test allows your, your data to estimate what that is. So you don't have to know the variation in the data, in the population. The T gets around that by estimating it for you. So with the T, you would see S over the square root of N. And S is just the SAMP, the, the ab, like what you just mentioned. It's the standard deviation of your data, your actual histogram. Because we could record, we could actually calculate, instead of just the average, we could calculate the standard deviation of these observations. And that would go in the numerator of the standard error of the mean. Does that make sense? OK. <laughs> We'll see, we'll see the t-test in just a minute, so hopefully that will be more clear when we get there. Okay, so again, kind of putting the cart before the horse, we have to really talk about some of the stuff that we're, like I'm using mu's and sigmas. But the idea here is we are asking questions about parameters, things that we can't observe. And since we can't observe them, what we do, like to do is indicate them in a different way than things that we can observe. So if something is unobservable, we usually use a Greek letter for it. So if you see a Greek letter up here, you can probably assume that I can't, I can't directly measure it. It's like the population average response. But if you see a Roman letter, like an X or a Y, that indicates data. That's stuff that I can actually measure. So if I say X bar, I'm telling you I'm averaging data. Uh, or S is like a standard deviation of data. And that's what I'm getting at here. You don't have to worry about formulas. We're not going to do formulas. But I just want to show you that the statistics that we use, like X bar, which is the sample average, or P to represent a s proportion of a sample that has a particular characteristic, or even the test statistic T, notice it's a Roman letter. These are all functions of data. The X's represent, that's the patient one's response to your treatment. That's patient two's response to your treatment. That's, if you had 10 observations or 10 subjects, that's patient 10's observation or measurement uh, response to your treatment. The proportion is also an average. It's just you're counting how many of the patients responded versus how many of them didn't. And the test statistic we use to to describe how far away the truth is, excuse me, the truth is, mu, from what we observe. So what we observe versus what we expected if our hypothesis is true. So the key here is these are functions of sample data. Samples vary as a function of sampling variability. So they are, they are, they're random variables. Um, in Hypothesis testing, again, let's remind ourselves what the two hypotheses generally are statements of. Usually, whenever you go out to do research, you have a scientific hypothesis. I think X is causing Y, and I want to design an experiment to do it. So more than likely, you're going to set up your alternative hypothesis to be the statement of association. I, you know, X is associated with Y, or Y is associated with X. And in order to do the hypothesis test, you have to have a, all other truths, if you will, in one statement. And then we call that the null. And then if you can disprove, that, disprove, disprove everything else, then you have indirectly provided evidence in favor of your statement of association. And that's all we're doing. It's, like a, it's a method of indirect proof. Rather than proving that X is associated with Y, I'm going to demonstrate that, okay, I'm going to stop there because I'm going to get, I'm, I need to show you pictures as opposed to using words because it'll get, it'll get confusing really quickly. Uh, a little bit more terminology before we get into that. One-tailed versus two-tailed hypotheses. Simply, what's the direction of the relationship that you think? You think, if you think ahead of time, that you're going to, you expect an outcome in a particular direction. For instance, that when you administer this drug, you'll see a decrease in systolic blood pressure. If you're pretty confident that that's the direction of, of interest, that that's the direction it's going to happen in if it happens, or 
if that's the only direction you care about, then do a one-tailed test. But if you don't know the effect, it could be high, it could be low, it could be an increasing effect or a decreasing effect, and it's important to be able to detect that shift in either direction, you need to use a two-tailed test. Those, that's all you need to know. Do you, for instance, it might be a safety issue that would force you to use a two-tailed hypothesis because what if the drug you're giving you think results in a decrease in something, but if it were to by chance result in an increase, that could actually cause major problems for the patient. So you want to make sure that you detect it in either direction, the direction of interest, but also just in case the opposite effect because if it's if it's going to result in a negative outcome for a patient, we need to make sure that we detect it. So that's the difference between the one-tailed and two-tailed test. Again, we tend to describe the characteristics of the population, those parameters that we're after with Greek letters. So our hypotheses, if you were to write them out in statistical form, would be relationships between parameters or relationships between parameters and hypothesized values. So for instance, if I hypothesize that the response rate for an experimental therapy is greater than that of a standard of care, I'm saying that the proportion of patients in the population who get the experimental therapy is bigger, excuse me, and who respond is bigger than those who would respond if they had gotten the standard of care. So that's your scientific hypothesis, your alternative hypothesis. Your null would be that there's, uh, that it's not bigger, that they're equal, for instance. Type 1, type 2 error and power, again, um, type 1 error is a false positive result. I'm looking for a difference. I found a difference, so I flagged it with a statistically significant p-value. I'm going to write it up and say there is an association between x and y when in fact the truth is there's not an association. So that's a false positive result. The opposite is a false negative result. So there is an association, but I failed to detect it. So my p-value is really big, and I made a type 2 error. And then power is just 1 minus the type 2 error rate. So power is uh, something that we often focus on because it's the ability of your experiment to detect a difference or to detect an association. The more powerful it is, the more likely you will detect uh, patterns if they're actually there. The commonly accepted rates I've written here, just understand that these are, they're historical. There's nothing magical about a, a, a level of the type 1 error of 5%. It's just that that's what's been used for 100 years, and it's a standard by which we operate. There are cases where this is too restrictive. And this, what I mean by this is this is the maximum type 1 error rate and the maximum type 2 error rate. If we think about the consequences of making the different kinds of decisions, or the different kinds of errors, that's where we should be setting our error rates. So sometimes the type 1 error is the most important kind of error to avoid, and sometimes the type 2 error is the most important kind of error to avoid. An example for this could be in cancer research, where maybe you're studying a cancer that has no, no good treatment. There is a standard of care, but it really doesn't do a whole lot to benefit the patient. It's really toxic. It doesn't give them a whole lot of time after diagnosis, and there are no other therapies available. So if you're doing a pilot study for a therapy that's promising in this population, what is a worse mistake to make? false positive, which means that in your pilot you find, you find that this has got some evidence of benefit and you move it forward into a larger study, or a false negative, which means that in truth this is that, this is that breakthrough drug that will provide some benefit to this patient population, but you missed it. Which of those is the worst error in that sense? The type 2. So what we want 
is in circumstances where you want to really protect yourself against making a type 2 error, 0.2 is too high. It might need to be 0.1 or 0.05. What does that mean? That means basically when you subtract it out and you get your power, you are powering your study very strongly to detect the difference because it's more important to detect it than to miss it. I can think of another example, example where the type 2 error is the less important, the type 1 error is more important. What if I'm doing a uh, very large randomized controlled trial? I did the pilot, I did a phase 1, I did a phase 2, and I've pushed this drug through the pipeline, and now I'm finally in this really large randomized controlled trial. The next step would be to actually change clinical practice. We're going to change clinical practice based on the results of this RCT. If we find that the drug is beneficial in this RCT, which would be a statistically significant finding. So there's two things that could happen. I could make a type 1 error here and say, this drug is better than the standard of care change practice, when in fact it's not better than the standard of care. The type 2 error would be failing to say it's better than the standard of care when in fact it is. So when, we're, when the next step is putting it in the population, the type 1 error is usually the error that's important to control. Now that's not to say we can let the type 2 error be really big. We still really control that as well. But I think changing clinical practice incorrectly is probably a bigger error than maybe delaying getting something out there. First, do no harm, exactly. And that, that's in, enclosed in that alpha. So again, truth versus conclusion. Um, you very often see this, but I, I just want to make sure that the, the takeaway message here is these are not always the rates that are optimal for your experiment. Make sure you understand the consequences of errors and try to set them based on that. So the basic recipe for hypothesis testing is that we have to first have hypotheses that are testable. And again, this is why um, I think meeting with a statistician at the beginning to make sure that you have testable hypotheses and you're actually collecting data in a way that will allow you to test them. The second step is that you have to assume the null is true. This is fundamental. This, is, this hypothesis testing does not work without this. What this is doing, when you assume the null is true, if you go back to the example that I had at the very beginning of today, where we set up the population, and I told you, let's assume the population looks like this. That's the null hypothesis. So you're assuming the null hypothesis is true, then you're conducting an experiment by drawing from that population. That experiment generates some data. You're going to compute uh, the sample statistic from it, like the sample mean. And then you can do a test comparing what you observed in your data against what you expected to observe in the if the population were truly as your null states it is. If that's a big difference, then you generally follow the data. I say that the data is strong enough in favor of something else going on that I'm going to reject the null. I'm going to say that's not what the population looks like. It looks like something else entirely. The way we do that is through p-values and test statistics. These two things together quantify the level of evidence within the sample that's, that, um, I hate to use the word in terms of it, that it's in disagreement, but that's really kind of what it is. It's a, it's a go or no-go decision. Um, and they also provide us with uh, confidence intervals. So the, the key here is that we need to determine at what point is our sample statistic or our evidence different enough from what we would have expected under the null for us to reject the null. And that's where we set our alpha level at 0.05, for instance. But the key is to do it beforehand. Don't just go into an experiment, do a test, and see what the p-value is, and then go, OK, it, the p-value is 0.05. Four, so I want it, my 
alpha level to be 0.05. Or maybe it's 0.051, so I want my alpha level to be something a little bit higher so I can claim that this is a statistically significant result. That is a discussion. The, the consequences of that is a discussion that's beyond the scope of this class. But I referred you to a textbook, not even a textbook, uh, a really great read by Lem Moyer called the, um, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of it, the p-value primer, that in, in English tells you what the consequences of decisions like that are, and he does it in such a way that you really understand why that's a mistake. Not just, don't do it, it's bad, it's not ethical. But he tells you why it's unethical, because it turns out that you are, you're negating the value of the p-value. The p-value has meaning until you conduct your experiment in a way that's different from this process. Yes? Okay. Mm -hmm. Correct. Alpha, so the difference, the difference between the p-value and the alpha is that alpha is the decision rule that you compare the p-value against. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Correct. Correct. Yeah, so the, the yeah. So your p-value is a function of your data alone. Alpha is something that you set yourself. You say my p-value needs to be at least, and I'm going to tell you what the p-value actually is in a second, which might clarify the relationship. But yeah, these are two different things. This is just that level of evidence that you need to meet with your p-value in order for you to make a certain type of decision. So if we go back to the TBI example, uh, let's suppose we did an experiment here. We have um, survivors of moderate or severe TBI. We've got 44 of them. And let's say we've got 36 healthy controls. In each of these two groups, we record the subject's cognitive status score. And we're going to compare their averages. And I think most people understand that when you compare two means, you're doing a t-test. Uh, actually, I'm going to start simple. I'm not even going to go to the two-sample t-test. Let's go to the one-sample t-test. Um, so let's do a one-sample t-test first, comparing the TBI sufferers, do I, is that what I end up doing? This is terrible. I can't, I made too many, too many tests. No, we're going to compare the healthy controls. No, the, the, sorry, the severe TBI, monitor severe TBI against what we think is normal, which is a value of zero. So we're going to start with the one sample T test, and I'm going to go through those steps for the hypothesis test. So again, we suspect in this sample that we have individuals who are cognitively impaired. So I'm hypothesizing that the average cognitive status score is less than normal, where normal is zero on this scale. In order to do the hypothesis test and to provide some evidence in support of this statement, I have to specify all other possibilities. So my null hypothesis will encompass cases where the, the evidence tells me that they're average, which is the mu equal to zero, and cases where they're actually enhanced in terms of their cognitive status, which is the greater than. So when I set up the cognitive status, when I set up the null hypothesis, that sets up that distribution that I'm sampling from. And I don't want to get into the details too much, but just know that the null really only ever is the boundary between those two. Again, kind of like with alpha, it's the point at which my two hypotheses, the regions are different. So the dividing line between these two is zero. Values to the left of zero are in favor of the alternative. Values of zero or to the right are in favor of the null. So really, we assume our distribution, our population is centered at that boundary point. 
And that's what I've done here, is I've set up the population, assuming a normal distribution, with some measure of variability of cognitive status score that could have come from the literature, or I could estimate it again from my data using the t-test. And then I do an experiment. So here's, again, mimicking what we did at the beginning of the class. There's all my sample data, their cognitive status scores. Notice, just taking a look at that cluster, they look like they're kind of shifted away to zero. They actually look like they're shifted a little bit toward negative values. But I visualize my data using a histogram, and I summarize it with a single summary statistic called the sample mean, and I take a look at it. The key here is, again, back to making a decision. The evidence that I actually got, that's that little yellow piece here, that little yellow mean. I want to know, is it probable? How likely is it for me to get a sample drawn from this population where the average is truly zero, the average cognitive status is truly zero, how likely is it that I would do an experiment in a scientifically rigorous way on this number of subjects and get an average this far away from what I expect. And the only way I know how to answer that is to get the sampling distribution of the sample mean. So again, this is a theoretical thing, right, that I've already demonstrated. We don't do a thousand experiments, but we understand because of mathematics the chances the number of experiments out of a million, for instance, that could be done that would result in what I actually got. What do you think, how, what's the likelihood of getting that yellow mean, which is what we got, if this is the distribution of all possible means that could have come from experiments done in this way? How many experiments would result in that yellow mean? Virtually zero, right? That's the p-value. That's the p-value. And there's two ways that we can tell our reader, our audience, how different what we observed is from what the null hypothesis told, told us to expect. That's the test statistic and the p-value. The test statistic, in this case the t, Notice it's, it's just a, a measure of deviation between the data and the hypothesis. That's all it is. Here's the data, the sample mean. This is the hypothesis, mu. We hypothesize this value to be zero. So that difference on the top is calculated. And then we have to scale it. We can't just take that raw difference. Everyone understands that you have to take a difference in the context of the actual variation in the data. And that's where the bottom comes in. Remember, this is the standard error. All this is is the standard deviation of means. The standard deviation of the sample mean from that sampling distribution. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm reporting the difference between what I observed and what I expected in standard deviations. When I scale it by this, this t is just a standard deviation. It's in units of standard deviation. So if my t, if my t is 2, if I do my test statistic and it's 2, then I know that what I observed is actually two standard deviations away from what I would have expected to get if the null hypothesis were true where the standard deviations again come from that theoretical sampling distribution. So in other words, the bigger it is, the more uh, in disagreement the data is with the null hypothesis. So if I fill in the numbers from my actual study, if I were just to look at the top, what I observed was an average cognitive status score of negative 0.7. What I expected to get was a zero if the null hypothesis was true. So that's a difference of only 0.7. Now, I'm a statistician. I have no idea what this score looks like. So to me, that looks like it's close to zero. But again, we have to understand the variability in the data. So if I scale it by the standard error of the mean, and this gets to your question about how do I do the standard error, I compute the standard deviation of the data. That's the standard deviation of all those scores I actually have in hand. 
and divide by the square root of the sample size. And that's just the standard error, the estimated standard error, if you will, of a sampling distribution. So that's point one. So what that's telling me is that the standard deviation of sample means is only point one. And if I were to get something that was within a standard deviation of the average, I should get something between negative point one and positive point one, but I got negative point seven. So this is actually a very, very unusual result if the null hypothesis is true. So how likely is it to run an experiment on 44 patients and get an average of negative 0.7 if the truth is that the average is zero? And the answer is not very likely. We can actually compute a probability though. Everybody likes to think about things in terms of the likelihood of something occurring. So the p-value is just the probability that our result, or anything, or any samples more extreme than our result, were generated by this distribution. And what are the chances here? It's like less than 0 .001. So again, the p-value is the area in the tail. Uh, the reason we're out here to the left is because, remember, our interest is in decreased cognitive function. So we're looking for evidence out here in favor of decreased cognitive function. If I was looking for enhanced cognitive function, my hypotheses would have been different and my p-value would actually be out in the other, on the other direction of the, um, of the distribution. But you can think of the p-value as the chance that this result is simply a function of sampling variability, which is what we know causes people to draw a bad hand and get one of those weird samples that gives us data that results in evidence that's not really reflective of the population. There's always a chance that sampling variability caused your result, even when your result looks like it's reject the null. There's always a chance that you're making a wrong decision, and that's the type 1 error rate, the alpha. But here again, the p-value is less than 0 .0001. So the probability that this result or something more extreme is generated by an experiment done in this population is very small. So I can be pretty confident then if I've done everything the right way that I have found evidence that sampling vari variability alone didn't produce my result. Something else is going on, more than likely, what I have is a cognitively impaired population. Some other distribution describes the population, probably one where the mean is less than zero. Another way to interpret this in English is that less than 0.01% of all experiments, or all means, that could be generated from experiments like this, when the truth is at least zero, are this extreme. So that just, we have a very, very extreme result. And again, this comes to the decision rule. We don't, I mean, sometimes we see p-values or evidence this strong, but sometimes we're in a little bit of a gray area, which, again, to make sure we don't fall victim to our own uh, human instincts of trying to find evidence that matches our bias, what we do is we tell ourselves in writing, in a protocol or a plan before time, before, ahead of time, how small does my p-value need to be before I'm confident in concluding that something else is producing my result, not the null hypothesis. And that's why we set alpha to be, for instance, 0.05. P-value has to be 0.05. In other words, I'm comfortable if I get a p-value of 0.05, I'm comfortable with uh, this being, with making a false rejection 5% of the time. You know what I mean? So it's kind of a likelihood. Um, so if, p, if, if you end up with a p-value that's met your, love, your threshold of evidence, the chances of getting the evidence collected from the sample, given the null hypothesis is true, are small enough for you to be comfortable to reject the null. The observed data conflicts with your null theory, 
And it actually supports your alternative theory that there's cognitive impairment in this population. So since the evidence was actually observed and our theory is unobservable, we choose to follow our evidence as the more accurate portrayal of reality and reject the null in favor of the alternative. And that's all hypothesis testing is doing. Often though, again, like I mentioned, we don't have as strong of a result. Um, maybe we end up with uh, a sample mean that's not quite as different from what we would expect. And for, for instance here, this, maybe we got a sample mean that's actually negative 0.1, which we know is only one standard deviation below what we expect. Remember how the bottom of that teeth statistic was, was 0.1? So here the p-value is not less than 0.05. In fact, it's almost uh, 0.45, almost 0.45, which tells us that 45% of experiments, of all experiments that could be done in this way, would produce a result as different as ours is from the um, null hypothesis. And I wouldn't be comfortable saying that this was produced by some other distribution because it's highly likely that it came from this population. So again, if the probability, the p-value doesn't meet your threshold of evidence, then you fail to reject the null. You just say, I, I'm not comfortable saying that the alternative is, is the truth. This could have been generated by the null distribution as a function of sampling variability. The issue is, we don't like black and white, and we want to know if the decision that we made was the correct one, and we don't. We don't ever really know until, unless there's some case where we're able to actually observe the truth, and then we can verify it against that. There's always a chance that you've made an incorrect decision, even when you've got a very well-powered and designed experiment. We just know, because of the way we design the experiment, that the chances of us making errors in our decision are small, relatively small. What if um, there are some things, though, and I didn't mention this, but this bottom bullet's important. We have no way of knowing whether we made this kind of error. We only know that our chances of making it are relatively small if we performed a valid experiment. In other words, if we don't have bias. So how could bias have caused the result of our very simple contrived experiment of detecting cognitive deficits in this population? So we were hypothesizing that the average of our sample was equal to zero or less than zero, where we assumed zero on this scale meant normal. And that's a big assumption, right? Because we all know that instruments and even uh, more objective measurements might not be truly reflective of normal. There might be bias in the measuring process. So one of the issues here, since we did a one sample test, what if the cognitive status score that we're measuring, that we're recording, isn't actually measuring what we think it's measuring? What if it's measuring cognitive status and something else? So that blows away our assumption that zero is where we need to be focused. If if a score of zero isn't truly reflective of normal, maybe that actually reflects some kind of enhanced functioning. How could we modify our experiment to eliminate or minimize this problem? Rather than doing a one sample test comparing our results to a value, what could we compare our results to instead? A control group, a control group of healthy people, right? Normal functioning people, because then it doesn't matter what the zero means. We would be comparing cognitive status measured in this, this particular measure in people we think have um, deficits to people who should be average or normal. And so then if normal isn't really zero, that should be captured in our healthy controls, which is again why we have control groups. It allows us a reference of comparison. You need to always report an effect size along with your p-value, so the clinical significance can be evaluated as well as your statistical significance. Um, I think that this is done pretty regularly now. Sometimes you do still get a hold of manuscripts where they don't do a good job of relaying 
what they actually detected. They just put a bunch of p-values in a table. Um, one of the ways that you can report what the, the effect size that you actually found, report the actual difference, the estimate of the actual difference, or the estimate of the actual association, and then report, for instance, a confidence interval around it. The confidence interval captures sampling variability. So again, I already kind of mentioned the interpretation of the confidence interval. You tell the reader, this is my, what my experiment said the best estimate is of the population average. But experiments performed in the way that I performed this one could have resulted in averages as low as this or as high as this. And that's what a confidence interval is telling you. It's, it's telling you, again, from the sampling distribution, that 95% of all possible experiments done in this manner would give me a sample average between these two points. Mine happened to give you one that's right here. Yes. There is. Which is wrong. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. It is not that it doesn't have anything to do with the probability that it's capturing the truth. And so again, this, the, the sample, you know, 100 different experiments, 95 of them will be accurate five of them won't. So it's kind of, that's what the confidence means. And notice, just real quick, um, the confidence interval takes into account several things. It takes into account your guess, your estimate from the, uh, your experiment, sampling variability. Everyone see that this is the standard deviation of the sample means. That's the sampling variability. And then that T, which comes from a table, or a, you, know, you can find it in Excel or whatever, that's where our confidence comes in. Um, so what we do is we add and subtract, if we're doing a two-tailed, we're here we're doing a one-tailed, add and subtract some value called the margin of error uh, to get the confidence bounds. And the margin of error contains the sampling variability and our confidence. And so either increasing or decreasing confidence or increasing or decreasing sampling variability will impact the precision, how precise our confidence interval is. So now let's get into actual testing. Are there any questions before I move forward? I'll try to reiterate some of the concepts as we go through. I mentioned that one of the biggest questions that I get from uh, collaborators is, how do I analyze this data? Either I already have it, or I'm planning an experiment, and this is what I ha plan to have. Well, how, do I, how do I know which test to use? So you have to ask yourself, first off, what's your research question? And then, in other words, if you have hypotheses, or are you just doing estimation, what kind of data do you have? What's the information contained in your data? Is it nominal, like sex, or yes, no response? Or is it interval, like, um, no, I can't think of an interval variable, ratio, temperature, age, weight, blood pressure, everything's ratio right now. But anyway, so you can see, is it continuous or categorical? Understanding the kind of things that are appropriate for the kind of data that you have. And then the design of your experiment will dictate what kind of tests you can use. And when I say design, I mean, do you have like a single sample? where you're looking for associations between measurements collected on the same subject? Or do you have uh, multiple samples, like in a, in a uh, case control study or a, uh, um, a cohort study or a randomized controlled trial? Do you have um, pre-post measures? So for instance, you have a single sample or a single uh, cohort of people, but you're recording something about them before they are intervened upon and then after. So that design aspect of it, I need to know kind of how patients are either being randomized or not and how the data is being measured on them. And then, in, of course, you need to know what the size of your experiment is because if you have a really small experiment, you won't have necessarily enough data to do some of the more 
complicated or complex mathematical tests, you might have to do something that's non-parametric instead in order to make sure that you're not uh, artificially inflating your type 1 error. So some of the more common parametric approaches, and again, when I say parametric, I mean there are assumptions that must be verified before you report the result of that test just to make sure that, you're, that you've met the necessary requirements for producing a valid result. So if you have uh, an independent variable and a dependent variable that's continuous, so this is like a mean response. If you have no independent variable, that basically just means you've got a single sample and you want to know what's the average response. That's the one sample t-test. If you have a categorical independent variable, which basically says... Um, maybe individuals are classified into one of several groups, maybe treatment versus control or male versus female, however you're doing it, that categorical indicate, or that categorical independent variable, you're comparing groups here. So if you're just comparing two groups, a two-sample t-test will be fine. Three or more groups, though, you need to do analysis of variance. And it turns out ANOVA does the exact same thing the t does. It just compares means, but it compares means in, more, in three or more groups. What if you have a continuous independent variable? In other words, you don't have groups. You're not classifying individuals. You're measuring, maybe within individuals, uh, some continuous independent variable and then a continuous dependent variable, and you're interested in the association between the two. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of an example. I've got some examples later on. But that would be simple linear regression or maybe even correlation. If you have two or more um, independent variables and a continuous dependent variable, then that would be also linear regression, but now you have multiple predictors, x1 and x2, for instance. If you have a mix of continuous and categorical x's or predictors, um, that would also be multiple linear regression. It could also be there are some specific cases where you could apply something called analysis of covariance. But as you can see, it can get complicated very quickly. And it's imperative that you kind of understand the design of the experiment, what kind of data you have, and what your actual research question is so you can narrow down on the list. I've given you here some of the functions in our studio that you can use to implement several of the more common methods and the assumptions that you have to check. So if you're going to do a t-test, whether it be a one sample or a two sample t-test, paired samples t-test, it's just t-dot-test. And then there are just some options for you put the data in and you tell it I want to do two samples or I want to do paired but you have to check that the, the data is approximately normally distributed and that if you're comparing groups, that the groups have approximately equal variation in them because we know that having either one of these not be met could produce um, false results, either false positives or false negatives. ANOVA, notice the same exact assumptions, only now you've got more than two groups. If you're going to do correlation, uh, one of the most common ways is through the R, which is Pearson's correlation coefficient, and that can be implemented with a couple of different functions. Also, some assumptions that you have to verify. And then linear regression is done through the LM function. And then you just specify the model, Y is equal to X or whatever, and then you'll have to verify assumptions. Now, I'm giving you just some examples in our studio. You can do this in whatever software you're comfortable with, if you're comfortable with actually doing the method on your own. Um, if you have a small sample size, or if you just can't make your data, like let's say you're trying to do a t-test, and you just, there's no way without really trying to torture the data to get the assumptions to, to check out then you want to do something else. You want to do something like a median test or a sign test or a Mann-Whitney test, depending on, again, what your experiment is and what kind of data you have. Mann-Whitney is a very common alternative to the t-test in cases where um, maybe you have a small study 
or you can't verify assumptions or your assumptions just can't be met. And again, these tend to perform analyses on the ranks of the data as opposed to the values of the data itself. Spearman correlation is like a, the non-parametric version of Pearson's. Again, it's comparing the ranks. It's correlating the ranks of two continuous variables. And then there are tons of approaches to regression if you can't meet the assumptions of uh, the simple or multiple linear regression. And those, I would, I put a star next to those. You really should call a statistician, number one, to determine the method, but to, number two, to make sure that you can implement it correctly and interpret the output because it's, re it's doing some things that are unusual in order to make the regression model work. These, uh, this should say non-parametric approaches, can also be incorporated very easily in RStudio through these functions. The nice thing is these functions also produce tons of different results that you can call on, specific aspects of, of the findings, and you can get plots. If you have a, now we're getting away from continuous variables where we tend to, our, where we tend to hypothesize about average response. What if you're in a categorical dependent variable? So instead of uh, recording a patient's average res a patient's response to treatment on a continuous scale, you just record whether or not they responded. Or maybe you could have something like in cancer where we have a, an ordinal classification of response from uh, treatment failure to stable disease and then com partial and complete response, which is, you know, increasing in uh, benefit as you go up the scale. So one of these methods could be used if you were, for instance, comparing the distribution of responses from uh, failure to complete response between two groups. You could do a chi-square test, Fisher's exact test, or logistic regression. Um, and, and you notice here that logistic regression can really be done for any of the lower ones. When we have what's essentially one sample, we might do a binomial test or a chi-square goodness of fit test. Assumptions for these methods, again, are l much less restrictive and they tend to revolve just around the sample size. So you might have to have a certain number of patients in your study respond before you can do something. In other words, that response rate needs to be, it can't be zero. And it can't be one because then everybody responded or no one responded and there's no variation in your data. And then here in our studio are some of the functions that will implement each of these. I always like to incorporate this slide because it has kind of a hierarchy. That it's almost like a decision tree here, right? If, how many groups do I have? I have more than two groups. Do I have a large sample size and normality? Yes. If I don't, I go over here. Um, do I have independent samples, more than two independent samples, or do I have dependent samples, which would be like repeated, repeated measures or something? Independent sa samples would be ANOVA. And a similar thing would be like the two-sample t-test whenever I have only two. So these are included in the slide just to show you all the different possibilities of tests when you're comparing the average. Let's do a real quick example of the one-sample test of the mean. Um, this example is, it revolves around an outbreak of salmonella-related illness attributed to an ice cream factory. The question was, whether or not the factory was the source. So scientists measured the level of salmonella in nine randomly sampled batches of ice cream produced at this factory, and then record levels. I think there's a threshold here at which, uh, bless you, it's deemed unsafe. And so here you can see the different measurements. The question is, is there sufficient evidence that this plant is the source of the outbreak or should we rule them out? So in order for them to be the source, they have to have a certain amount of this bacteria in their batches. And so that, that cutoff point of safety is 0.3. So if we get a sample, if we did this experiment from these, um, this, these nine different randomly sampled batches and we produce evidence in favor of 
the average level of this bacteria being greater than 0.3. What did I say? I'm not sure what the, I don't remember what the MPN per gram, does anyone know what that is? <laughs> I can't remember. Um, if it's greater than 0.3, then we would, we would have sufficient evidence to conclude that this is likely the source of the outbreak. However, anything that's not quite that big, in other words, 0.3 or less, there's just not strong enough evidence to say that this is the source of the outbreak. Um, it's possible to get nine randomly sampled batches and produce an average that's, you know, 0.3 and still not have them be the source of the outbreak. So in our studio, we could do the t-dot test function. And there's a, notice you just have to give it a couple of things, a couple of uh, arguments here. So you're telling it to do the t-test on some data, which I've called x, and I'll pull this up in a second. I want the alternative hypothesis to be greater than. I could put greater than or just put g. Notice the alternative hypothesis is greater than. Greater than what? Mu equal 0.3. And that's all I have to tell it for it to give me the t-test. So if I go into, I'm going to do it just from R instead of R studio. Um, give me just a second. Let me change the view on this. Is that easier to read? So I'll copy. Now this is using just R. R Studio's interface is much more aesthetically pleasing and user friendly. But this is the program that R Studio is running that you don't have to interact with. So what I've done here first, and it, by the way, R and R Studio work like a calculator. I actually, when I'm at my desk, and it's been so long since I've done mental math, if I'm having to add up a couple of numbers, I open up R instead of the calculator because I can type the numbers in right away. I can see what I typed and it gets the, the value right away. So what I've got here is rather than pulling in the data in an Excel spreadsheet, which you can also do, um, again, kind of beyond the scope of this class, but you've got your data in here. Um, I've given you here uh, information Oh, hold on. Am I pulling? I pulled up the wrong script. Yep, I did the wrong script. Sorry. This is the one sample T. Ignore that. So here's the data. It could have come in an Excel spreadsheet where you just had a column of records. Pull it in and call it X. So I've I've done it using R just R programming because I'm a little bit more familiar with how it works, but that's X. It's just a series of observations of those nine batches. And if I want to do a t-test, I got to first check assumptions. So one of the nice things about R is it's got really user-friendly help. So if you just do question mark and the name of something, it will pull up help on that function. It also, I would use Google all the time for R. Uh, because there are, because it's open source, which means that people all over the planet are contributing code to it, there's, uh, there's information out there, more information than you can take in. I generally can type my question in, and the very first link at the top will be, have the solution, even for pretty complicated questions. So I know I want to do a box plot of this data so I can see what it looks like. And so there's my box plot. Um, it's only a single sample, so the y-axis represents the level of bacteria. The box plot, if you remember, between the two boxes, the, between the two ends of the boxes, I have the inner 50% of the data. That's the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. And then my whiskers go out to the boundaries of the data, and that dark line represents the average. It's always important to just double check and make sure because different softwares create box plots a little bit differently. Now I want to compute some summary statistics, which is also very easy. I just want the mean. I said, give me the mean of x. Give me the standard deviation of x. So the mean 
is 0.456, which is actually above 0.3. But I wonder if this is far enough above 0.3 to be strong enough for us to reject the null. The standard deviation is 0.2128. How I check normality is something called a QQ plot. I could also use the box plot. Let's talk a little bit about the box plot. So we can tell at least symmetry in the data. Everyone see that? That the two whiskers are approximately the same size. The, the mean is approximately in the middle. And the box itself is not all that different from symmetric. I mean, it, there's a little bit of asymmetry, but it doesn't look any, there, nothing is very concerning here. But one key is, in any software, there should be a play to produce a QQ plot. And a QQ plot is really, I think, a definitive tool for identifying normality. The QQ plot just, again, like in hypothesis testing, you assume a distribution for your data, and then on one axis, you're plotting what you would expect if the data is normal. On the y-axis, you plot what you actually have. And then if what you observe is equal to what you expect, then you should have data that follows a straight line. That's all it's doing. And we do have data here that's following a straight line. So what I observe in my data is what I would expect if it was truly normally distributed. So there's no concerning aspect here. If I have data that deviates much from this straight line, then I might want to investigate further and, and maybe do some work to get it to achieve normality. You know, I often produce it by default, but I like to visualize the data. I really, I really trust the, the graphs. And then maybe if it's you know, if, it's, if I'm kind of in a gray area, then I look at the test and see if, you know, does it have some strong evidence? And if it's kind of meh, then I don't worry about it. <laughs> That's my scientific approach. And you probably ask another statistician, they'll tell you something different. Um, someone asked a question. Oh, yeah, we do have questions. Thank you. So Maggie's first two questions I think we addressed because some people in the audience had the exact same questions. How do we calculate? Okay, so if we did the same test you're showing for the mean. So Maggie, the variability in the standard deviation measurements would not look like a normal distribution. There's actually a whole other sampling distribution for describing measures of variability. And that's kind of, again, since we're not doing hypotheses about the variability, I didn't include it in here. But yes, it's the same concept. There is a theoretical distribution that describes variability in the standard deviations. Um, is it really safe to make those assumptions before having data, i.e. when designing a study? So Maggie is asking, is it safe to make assumptions about whether or not to use a one-tailed or two-tailed test when designing a study? I think, again, just like anything else, it's a decision-theoretic approach. In other words, what are the consequences of not being able to detect an effect in both directions? And if the consequence could be patient safety, then you better be detecting an effect in both directions and setting it as a two-tailed test. If there are no consequences for failing to detect an effect in the other direction, then do the one-tailed test. Or if the consequences are, you know, minimal. So I think, again, that's up to the investigator beforehand. If it's important to detect both an increase and a decrease, even if you're only interested in one, then that's the way that you should go. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Yeah, if anybody sees that pop up, let me know, because I'm, I guess when we had our slides up, it didn't show for some reason. Yeah, 
It's supposed to show up, pop up over slides, but it's not doing that. I don't know if it's a setting that I need to set or not. But Okay, so back to the, ex the example that I have here. I wanted to show you briefly maybe what these, it's always useful to see what, what the data would look like if it didn't do what it was supposed to do. So if I had data that was not normally distributed, maybe it's really skewed, which I just made, I'll call it Y, I could do a box plot of this data. This is what I don't like about R. I like R Studio better. Notice this box plot, how different it was from the one before. Oh, that didn't help. That's a little bit better. So on the left, we have approximately normally distributed data. On the right, we have skewed data. And you can see the skewness because look at where, look at how short the lower whisker is relative to the upper and how short the bottom, quote unquote, half of the box below the mean is from the top. So I see that I have some skewness in the right tail. I could do a histogram of that data and then really see it. And then really the skewness comes in the form of a couple of, well, a lot of data out here in, the, in this upper right-hand tail. The QQ plot let me turn the device back off. The QQ plot, don't I have Y? Oh, QQ norm, sorry, QQ norm, Y, QQ line. The QQ plot, can everyone see here how we have, when we have skewness in the data, what we observe and what we expect don't follow a straight line? I have a really flat line down here and then I got some people up there that are unusual and there's a total break. That's indicative of skewness in your data when you don't have the, the straight line like we had before with our normally distributed data. Notice how it follows really nice and neat around that line that describes a perfect relationship. Did somebody else say something? No, it doesn't look good. Is there a threshold for an R-square value on the QQ line regression that would indicate? No, there's not a threshold. Um, because there are many reasons why you could get an R-square value that's high, even whenever you have really bad fit to the line. I think probably a visual and then a combination of the visual test along with um, maybe a true test of normality, which I haven't covered here, but it can be done with any statistical software. So if I wanted to do the t-test, I might want to understand the function first. I can do question mark t.test and, ooh, that's way too, way too zoomy. It just tells me that this performs one and two sample t-tests. It tells me what I have to have. I have to specify at least data. And if I just give it the data, then there's some default things that will happen. Um, the default is that it will do, I think, a two-sided test. But you can give it an X and a Y. You can give it just a data set. But you can tell it that you want a two-sided alternative, which means find something above or below my threshold. You can do less than or greater than. So whatever the directional arrow is in your hypothesis, null, excuse me, your alternative hypothesis goes in that alternative. And again, this is just the options. Just pick two-sided, less, or greater. If you notice, we just did alternative equal G, which stands for greater, and then tell it the mean you're comparing it against. You can also change confidence levels for producing confidence intervals and things like that. But again, not necessary if you're just trying to get your test done. So if we do a test, in this case, I called the t-test function. I gave it my data, which was stored in x above. Do a alternative hypothesis that's greater than, compare it to the cutoff of 0.3. So what I've done here is set up a normal distribution of my population, centered at 
and I'm hypothesizing that it, for my null that I should be getting values of 0.3 or less. And so based on what I actually got, which we, we calculated up here, I got a, a sample average of 0.456, which is above the threshold. And it turns out the p-value for that, that big of a sample average is 0.029727 with a test statistic of 2.2. So let's interpret this. The t tells me that the sample average is 2.2 standard deviations above what I, what I should have gotten, what I would have expected to get if the salmonella levels at this factory are truly 0.3 or less. And I got something 2 and 2.2 standard deviations above that, which tells me that there's a risk here. Uh, the p-value tells me that the probability that something, that an experiment done in this way would produce a result this extreme or, uh, or more extreme than what I actually got is 0.0297, which is relatively small. And so I think in this case, we need to make a decision to reject the null and maybe flag this place as the potential source for the salmonella outbreak. The confidence interval here gives us a lower bound only because again, we're interested in what is the true level of salmonella in this plant. And we really want to know in this case, what experiments done in this way, what's the smallest value of the average that could feasibly be produced. And that's 0.3245133, which is actually still above 0.3, which tells me that the vast majority of experiments would produce a result that would conclude in favor of this being the source of the outbreak. Let's go back to our slides. It looks like we're not going to get beyond um, means, so I actually have slides here that we'll pick up with next week. Another example, so that was a one sample test, two sample test is the same thing, only now instead of comparing a mean to a value, like 0.3, we're comparing a mean to a mean. And one of those means should be a reference group, a control group, and that's what we've got here. We've got two different drugs. Um, we want to know, are, do they have different blood clotting times? And so what we do is we observe, we randomly assign patients who come in to receive either drug B or drug G, and then we record the amount of time it took for their blood to clot. We have some summary statistics here. I could do this in our studio, but I think for the sake of time, I'm going to skip past that. I could pull this data in again through another, uh, through Excel or the way that I just did it, calculate the mean for each group, the standard deviation for each group. So it appears that on average, Drug G is resulting in a, an increased clotting time, which is actually a bad thing. It's, it's a little bit higher than drug B. The question would be then, let's produce, let's produce some, uh, some, thing, some metrics that allow us to incorporate sampling variability and confidence to see if these two things are really, can really be considered different, or is the difference that we're observing just um, uh, just a function of sampling variability in the data. And so our hypothesis is that they will um, produce different blood clotting times. And again, this is a case where, to get back to the question of whether I should ever do a one-tailed or two-tailed test, perhaps it's important if one of these is the experimental drug, maybe let's say B is the experimental drug and G is the standard of care, I need to know whether it's better but I also need to know whether it's worse because there are consequences for not detecting increased um, blood clotting time. And I'm going to do that against the null hypothesis that they're equal. So I'm going to assume they're equal and then I'm going to see what is, the, what is the likelihood of getting the sample means that we actually got if they truly are no different. So here's what we're hypothesizing. We're hypothesizing that the difference in their averages is zero. And I'm going to compare our observed averages. So I can do this again with that t.test function in our studio. I've got the code in our studio in R, and I will um, send that script for you all to show you how I indicate both x and y.
And this is how you specify models. You have your independent variable, excuse me, your dependent variable, and then just a tilde sign with a, just a list of your independent variables. Here we only have one. X in this case indicates whether they got drug B or drug G. Y is their blood clotting time. And so if I do that test, I can do it in our studio, I can do it by hand. I end up with a test statistic T, which again compares the observed difference, which for us was a difference of about negative, uh, oh my gosh, did I not write it down? I didn't write it down. Somebody do mental math here. One, it's basically one second, right? A difference, I'm assuming this is a second. I didn't write down the units. It's a difference of one scaled by the sampling variability, which is, comes to us in the form of the standard deviation of the sampling distribution when we're comparing two means. Notice it's different than when we were com just doing one mean because the math is a little bit different, but it's still the same thing. This is just the, sta the standard deviation of the sampling distribution for the difference in two means. And that gives us a T statistic of negative 2.55. So that's telling me that what I observed, the actual difference that I observed between the two groups is a full two and a half standard deviations below what I would expect if they were no different. And it turns out this, uh, the drug B is re resulting in the lower clotting times. So it's a pretty strong result. We can calculate the p-value, but now again, since before we did the test, we decided that we needed to detect differences in, in, that were in favor of B being a shorter time or B being longer, substantially longer than G. We have to get p-value in both tails because we need to know what fraction of experiments done in this way would produce a mean as unusual as ours or something more unusual and that would incorporate interesting means in both of the tails. And so our p-value for this test statistic t, which is again a function of our two sample means, compare, I don't have it here by the way, it's compared to zero, right? We're comparing it to zero, which is why you don't see a, a, a difference for what's expected. Um, that p-value is 0.03. So the probability that this result was produced simply by sampling variability is, is 3%. 3% of all possible samples would produce a result this extreme, which is not very many of them. What are the chances that you got one of those 3% and that the null is actually true? It's more likely that there is a difference in the two and you're detecting that with your experiment. And is this result clinically significant? So we have to report the size of the difference and incorporate sampling variability and our level of confidence in this estimate. And we do that through a confidence interval. So we report the estimate and then we can report the upper and lower bound So if I calculate it, again, I could do this in R, R Studio, whatever software you're, you're doing will produce this result. The confidence interval um, is plus or minus from our value 0.87. So the bounds, if I did the math, are negative 1.85 and 0.13. So again, if I interpret this the way it should be interpreted, 95% of experiments done in this way would produce a result as low as minus 1.85 and as high as minus 0.13. And so if I'm really interested in whether or not they're different, 95% of experiments would tell me they're different, right? Because if they're not different, I should be getting a zero. So I'm pretty confident that I'm one of the 95% and not one of the 5%, but there's still a chance that I'm one of the 5%. And if I wanted to change my level of confidence, I would have to change that measure of confidence in the calculation of this. Maybe I want to be 99%. Well, if I did 99%, what's going to happen is the bounds are going to go out because I have to then capture all possible results that would be produced by 99% of, of experiments, which is virtually all experiments, which might actually go up to zero.
but it'd be interesting to see. And so based on these results, we can conclude that drug B results in a reduction in clotting times. And we're pretty confident that it's a reduction. But the question is, if I produce this result, is it clinically meaningful? And I don't know the answer to that because I don't know if a difference, I don't even remember what the units were for this example. Is a difference of basically one clinically meaningful? And that's up to the scientist. The assumptions of the t-test, again, it's parametric, so we have to assume normality. And we have to check that. The best way, I think, is the QQ plot, but you can do it in combination with a formal test of normality. And then in the case of two samples, you have to check for equal variances, and that's the Levine test. I'll send you the R code if you wanted to replicate that example. Uh, you can just run it. It'll be very easy to see the box plots to verify that they do have equal variance and that you don't have a, a difference in the, the variances of the two groups. If we were to do this from a non-parametric point of view, the consequence would simply be that you might have a less powerful test. So for instance, if I tested, if I did this example, rather than using a t-test, maybe I used a Mann-Whitney test because when I look at the box plots and I actually test whether the variances are equal, I find some issues with the assumptions then you should, in that case, use the non-parametric because it's going to give you a more robust or a more valid look at the treatment effect in that case. If I were to do it, even when I could have done the t-test, I'm going to lose power. So anytime you use a non-parametric test, you're going to do it at the expense of a little bit of power, but you'll get a more accurate result when you're violating the assumptions of the parametric uh, test. Inferences on more than two means, and then we will stop here. This one will not be done in our studio. It's just to show you uh, the difference between the t-test, which is appropriate only for one or two groups, and when you have more than two groups, you should be doing ANOVA. So uh, this is in smoking cessation. Suppose there are three different types of therapy. One is pharmaceutical, one is behavioral, and one is just the control, like a literature-based. Uh, the dependent variable here will be some measure of uh, quitting. So it could be the reduction in cigarettes smoked per day after six months. Notice it's, an, it's a continuous outcome, so we want to approach this from the perspective of comparing the average across the groups. And so that hypothesis actually looks like this that the average of all three groups is different, is the same, the alternative would be that at least one of them is different. If at least one of them is different, I want to be able to detect it. So in the case of more than three groups, or more than two groups, you need to do ANOVA. But the assumptions are identical. You still have to have approximate normality. You still have to have approximately equal variance in each of the three groups. There's a good rule of thumb here for checking variability within each group, even for the t-test. You can produce your summary statistics. Take a look at your standard deviations in your groups and then find the one that has the smallest variation and the one that has the largest and make sure there's not a two-fold difference between those two. If there's a two-fold difference, then if you, you probably need to um, make accommodations for that. Do a non-parametric test or try to find a transformation that would make it fit. So to do ANOVA in our studio, or in anything, it will produce an ANOVA table. It will include things like what, what are called the degrees of freedom of the test. It will produce sums of squares and mean squares. It will produce a test statistic. So this is now an F, not a T, like we had before. And a p-value. And this is R, this is just regular old R output. And notice it's flagged it for us. It's flagged it with three stars, which tells us that it's highly significant. So if it's highly significant, then we're rejecting the null hypothesis. In other words, we have evidence that at least one of these groups is very different from the others. And it could be that they're all different. The, the big thing here when you're using ANOVA is that why are we using something like this why, that doesn't look anything like uh, t. We're using things called mean squares. 
So mean square is just another name for variance. So we have a variance here that we're attributing to the treatment group, which is X. And then we have a variance here that we're, we're attributing to error or noise, which is basically all the just natural variation in smoking behaviors that can just be attributed to, from person to person differences. The underlying assumption of medical research is that if you treat two individuals in the exact same way, they're going to produce responses that are more similar than two individuals who are treated differently. And that's what ANOVA is doing. It's measuring the variation in outcomes for individuals who are treated differently and comparing it to the variation in outcomes for individuals who are treated the same way. And if you have more variation between treatments than you do within a treatment, then you attribute it to the treatment effect. You say that there is, the treatment is causing certain individuals to respond differently. And the way we do that is through this F statistic. So it's a ratio of those two variances. So whenever we have more variation in patients who are treated differently than in those who are treated in a similar way, then we say that there's a treatment effect. And you can see it here in three different box plots. So if I'm comparing three different groups, the box plots represent the distribution of responses within each of those groups. The F statistic will be detecting something. So I can visually see two different sources of variation here. I can see a within group variation. And this is why it's so important that you have equal variance in each group. Because that equal variance ensures that, that when we talk about uh, within group variation that we can get an estimate that's consistent across the, the three groups. That one group isn't doesn't have much more variation within it than the other, which would screw up our experiment. So here we can see we have equal variation within each of the box plots. But the variation between groups is described by the variation in the location of the box plots. So you see that there's more variation by the stair step increase in box plots here than there is within. And more than likely, our F statistic will be able to detect that because that's just the data. That's not a confidence interval. A confidence interval would be much more tight around the mean. But you can see the mean, the average response, is increasing. In this one, the variation, notice it's all over the place. If I'm trying to estimate the variation uh, for patients who are treated in identical ways, I might get different estimates depending on which group I look at. So this could actually impact the results of our F statistic. In other words, it would basically result in not finding any difference, even though we might still see the same pattern of differences in the average response. Because the, the level of variation in the data is so big and it differs by group, our F will not be able to detect it. And in the bottom, notice we don't have, we don't really have substantial variation across the three groups. The means are almost identical and we have additionally some issue with the unequal variation in that third group. So this is what an ANOVA is detecting within versus between group. And taking a ratio of those two will tell you whether or not you have enough variation between individuals who are treated differently um, to to conclude that there is a true treatment effect. So here, our F statistic is 22.64. So the interpretation of this is that that ratio on the top, the value on the top is 22 times as big as the value on the bottom. The variation for individuals who are treated differently is 22 times as big as variation in outcomes for individuals who are treated the same way. That's a lot of difference. So um, that ratio corresponds to a very small p-value. And again, the p-value here is the same. What's the probability that sampling variability produced our result? What's the, pro what's the probability or what fraction of experiments would produce this, uh, this, res this extreme result or one more extreme? if it's true that there's no treatment effect. 
And the answer is virtually zero. I'd have to multiply this out. It's in scientific notation, but it's basically zero. So I feel confident rejecting the null and concluding that there's some difference among these groups. There is a treatment effect, but with ANOVA, unlike with the t-test, there's an additional step that you have to do to report what you found. You can't just report there's a difference. You have to tell the reader what the difference was, and that requires what's called a post hoc comparison. Um, and again, we could, there are whole classes on ANOVA because there are so many of these techniques for doing post hoc comparisons, but I'm just giving you one here. Tukey's is one, Fisher's is one, um, that allow you to do pairwise comparisons. So I can compare uh, the pharmaceutical to the behavioral. I can compare the pharmaceutical to the literature only. I can compare the behavior to the literature. I can do all combinations of means. And you can do that very easily in our studio using the Tukey HSD function. And what this gives you is a table down here at the bottom that tells you your comparison groups. Um, group B versus Group A, Group C versus Group A, Group C versus Group B, and I'd have to go back up and see which group is which. But um, that gives you an estimate of the difference in their uh, averages. So there's a 6.6, .6. the average difference between Group A and Group B is 6.6, .6. and then it gives you a confidence interval on that. It's as small as 2.4, as high as 2.8, and then an adjusted p-value for that comparison. So you can then identify which of the pairwise differences is statistically significantly different. And it turns out here, it appears that at the 0.05 level that they're all different. But it allows you to also describe the, dis the difference that you observe. The biggest difference occurs between A and C. I believe A is the pharmaceutical therapy, B is the behavioral therapy, and C is the con literature control. And so that is the conclusion um, that both behavioral and pharmaceutical therapy are superior um, or they result in a, in a better outcome for people who are trying to stop smoking than individuals who just receive literature. And so to wrap up, this is inferences on means. We will do more on this when we get to simple linear regression because that's also inferences sometimes on means. But it con concerns a continuous response why we've had you know number of cigarettes we've had blood clotting times we've had level of a bacteria detected in a, in a sample we've had um, you know many continuous outcome examples and then you can do it with one two or more groups if you do one or two groups the t-test more than two groups ANOVA and then once you do ANOVA you have to further do post hoc comparisons in order to be able to describe the difference. Make sure though if you do these that you don't just neglect to check assumptions. Uh, it's very easy to just do the t-test and report the result without, without making sure that the t-test actually is giving you a valid measure of the um, difference that you're looking for. And again like I mentioned when you're comparing means there are so many. This is why when statisticians go to graduate school we have a course in experimental design because look at this is the top half of a table that was crossing three pages and I just wanted to show you the top half and some of these you'll never see in practice the Yowden square design I've never used it but it's a possibility so there are many different ways of doing that next time we will cover chi-square tests I will probably remove one of these examples so we can spend more time on uh, things that I think are uh, most interesting to medical researchers, the survival analysis and maybe regression and correlation methods. So we'll, we'll cover briefly so a little bit about the yes-no or success-failure response and then we'll get into these others as well. Any questions? We're right at time. Okay. If anyone needs their parking validated, please let me know. I have stickers up here for you.